All right, all right, all right. Welcome back to another hour of Scotch Hour. I'm Noah. And I'm Jesse. All right, Jesse. So, hey, hopefully you had another great week. Hopefully all of our uh, all of our viewers and listeners had a great week as well. I think we have another fun show here. We are going to be doing the best of Batman. That's right. Uh, we went to a really great restaurant tonight uh, in Parker called the... Tailgate. Tailgate. And... Uh, some shout outs and uh, I think that's about it, right? That's our normal lineup. That is it. Any last minute uh, housekeeping uh, things we need to cover? No, I uh, hope you guys all enjoyed and endured the full extent <laughs> of our previous show, episode 51. Uh, and Kennedy, uh, a lot of good facts there as we continue to evolve and adapt. This was definitely one of our longer shows, but tons of good information in there. So thank you guys and gals who took the time and watched it, and uh, especially for all of the feedback, whether you liked it, um, what you liked about it, and I really appreciate you guys uh um feedback that was awesome exactly i yeah it is great that they had we had some great feedback yeah. this uh this past episode and uh it's really nice to um actually comment back to some people who left some comments and uh yeah it's an important topic and i think that's one thing where you and i both found this passion for it which is yeah it's so easy to look at a little piece of history and just take it for granted and i and also it was a very tragic time in history so a lot of people probably do just want to forget about it but as technology changes as things advance and you can find new facts just keep your mind open that's what we ask and uh, just to let you know this episode is brought to you by paul Hainer, beer <laughs> and bevy's liquor store i'm just joking <laughs> we, get, we get no kickbacks nothing like that i'm just joking everybody unless you want to Oh, it's this week, very happy to uh, look at this beautiful deep forest green box with gold writing in the Kragenmore Distillers Edition. This particular one uh, was distilled in 2007, was cast, if you will, and then bottled in 2019. It's a Speyside single malt scotch. Uh, Kragenmore Distillery is located in the village of Ballin uh, in Banshire, Scotland. It resides off the banks of the River Spey at the Kragen Burn um, as its water source and more and more one of the things that i'm really enjoying and seeing very true is a lot of these mm, great distilleries really do have a prized water source that they seek that they go after that they uh, consistently use um this scotch here is reputed to be one of the most complex and characterful malt whiskeys of the space i region and as we've visited different areas and regions isla the isle of sky with talisker scotches isla uh, of course you've got uh, my favorite Lagavulin, we've got um, Oban and some of these others, uh, you do start to see unique characteristics based on where the distilleries are located. So uh, this one I am very excited for um, as I start to uh, unbox it. And do you want to read uh, a little bit more about the history? Well, the, I think the first thing I'll probably mention here is as you're unboxing it is uh, we have pretty much gone almost like <laughs> back to back to back weeks just by simply default of having women distillers yeah or, or uh, women scotch makers uh and this and the, for this particular uh, distillery uh her name is laura vernon yes so that's uh i think that was just like pure pure dumb luck yeah yeah i actually i mentioned that to a couple of females and one in particular was like oh, that's because women have better taste and i was just like well hmm you know i, I can't argue that i don't know that she does is, is that is that a really taste. an arguable point though i mean i don't know i mean if they're drinking and enjoying the same scotches who knows but here, nonetheless, I think what she was really referring to was an ability to uh, use different uh, feelings, sensations. Um, I don't know of a ton of 
female sommeliers, but the few I am aware of uh, do very well for themselves. So <laughs> obviously they're very talented <laughs> and probably truly do have a gift. I'm the average sommelier for those. The gift of to taste and nose. Oh my goodness. I'm telling you, man, uh, lots of ton fun, bad jokes there, but I'm telling you, man, <laughs> like, if you I'm surprised you didn't <laughs> jump in on any of those. I mean, <laughs> I kind of like lofted it up there for you. Know? That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, a sommelier is very capable and a gr great sommelier is making in the half a million dollar salary right now. Um, that's just amazing. These people get to travel and visit and enjoy phenomenal uh, wines in most cases. But uh, what, a, what a treat to be able to, to your point, try another one of these great scotches with the, where the master blender is a female. Yeah, I think it's kind of a cool a cool note there. Yeah. And opposite of uh, Glenn Morangi, which had like the super long necks that have the spirit animal of a, mm -hmm. of a giraffe. Uh, this particular one has a relative, relatively short and have flat tops, which have uh, an effect on the taste and aroma of their whiskey. So maybe their spirit animal might be a slug. I don't know. <laughs> no, man, it's a rhino. It's a rhino. It's a tiny still. <laughs> the rhino is going to come after me for that one. A um, couple quick little tidbits of history. And it's fun. One of the things I am really enjoying as we get more into the histories of some of these Distilleries of 1869, Big John Smith founded Craig and Moore. Big John. That's right. Um, he was said to be the most experienced distiller of the day, which is very possible considering he was a former manager at uh, the McAllen, Glen Livet, Glen Far Class, and one of which I am not yet familiar with, the Wishaw Distillery. I've not heard of Wishaw. Either. Yeah. So, well, but the other ones I am familiar with. Yeah. Um, so with this, though, he leased the land, started a distillery. It was his dream. Uh, is right by the Strathspray Railway, which is no longer a railway, unfortunately. Times change. More efficient and effective ways for distributing and, and delivering goods have come since then, and that one was no longer needed. But he did it intentionally because of the water source and the rail line, which was to be able to get goods in and also to get able to get his scotch out. So pretty smart there. Um, Seems like uh, like a lot of distilleries during like World War One, World War Two area. They also uh, uh, had their production uh, suspended during wartime. Yeah, it's very. Uh, that's one of the fun parts about this. One of the things that's interesting. So, 1887, his first whiskey special leaves the Ballandalock Station for Aberdeen. Uh, Twenty-five wagons carried 300 casks of Craigenmore. 1901. Craigenmore was rebuilt, got destroyed. I wonder if that was a war. Just an idea. Maybe. <laughs> 1912, Gordon Smith dies. His widow, Mary Jane, takes over. So Big John Smith. Mary Jane Gordon, Parker. Yeah, right. <laughs> Gordon Smith. Uh, in 1917, production is suspended because of wartime. I think what's really key here is to, to think about some of these different timelines, World War I, World War II, what they did to some of the different distilleries, to some of the different uh, single malt scotches, whiskeys um, around the world even, and don't downplay the impact that had on a lot of our, our special challenges as well. Uh, so in 1923, Mary Jane sells the distillery to White Horse Distillers who rate the whiskey in A1 1925, a new warehouse is erected where erected erected where three hundred erected <laughs> erected three hundred and sixty thousand gallons of Craigmore <laughs> can be aged. So now we're starting to really get this uh, potential. Nineteen forty one, guess what? World War Two halts production due to barley shortages. Nineteen sixty one, coal fire stills and technology really start to take their impact. Um, in sixty four, production was increased with a doubling stills. So now you've got two for wash and two for spirit. Um, Nineteen 72, all four stills are converted to steam. Um, and since then, a couple of the other key notes, um, Diageo now owns and uses the Craigenmore distillery. Um, and with that, a lot of their whiskey, their scotch goes to blends, um, of which not all are scotch at all. So a key point here I think you kind of brought up is um, during, during World War II, they halted production due to barley shortages. Mm. I think that kind of pertains to, the, to today's time. 
Yeah. What, what kind of shortages are we seeing now? Ah, very interesting. Yeah, and absolutely very astute. I <laughs> need to bring that up. Uh, like where? Yeah, where did it all go? I don't know. So. And uh, so total wine seventy nine ninety nine, right? That's the retail. That is the retail. Um, and and that was it's kind of a steal if you get that. That's for this particular one because most of them were going for ninety nine. Yeah, there. I know there was like a newer uh, distillers edition. So this there's the uh, the new edition that came out, and that's going for ninety nine ninety nine. And I think this is the previous year's. Yeah, forty uh, percent alcohol by volume. And we're going to find out if this tastes half as good as this bottle is handsome. It is. A, it has a nice green color to it. Yeah. Is it a forest green or what would call it green? Yeah, it's man. Called? I want to be an army ranger. I, <laughs> I want to live a life of danger. <laughs> the Breakfast Club, man. That's like a totally awesome movie. It is 80s. a great movie. It really is a great movie. Or at least that's what I think of when I, when I hear that song. Yeah. Uh, clear bottle. So definitely, as you can tell by the color through this clear glass, this is a deeper scotch in color than some of the ones we've enjoyed recently so this one here right is 40 abv as compared to the most of our other ones at 43 right? 43 absolutely and some of the other distillers uh 46 range okay has your nice wooden top that you like it looks like from over here i mean she likes the wooden top shit and a tight fit glugs glugs for days That's him letting me know he wants a big pour of glugs for day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but sure. I mean. It's code. <laughs> glugs for days, Jesse. Glugs for days. All right. Um, and I guess we'll do our warp speed here. So we'll just do our quick clip there. All right. Uh, so welcome back uh, we did our uh, our tasting here and uh he, i'm very impressed with this i've never had this uh particular distillery before or any kind of single malts from them and uh i did enjoy i did enjoy it a lot i think it has like a really like when i look at the at the color here um in my notes here i put a nice copper to medium gold color and um as far as the bouquet goes i got um Hints of a light cigar smoke mm. is what I kind of picked up from it, and with a slight sweetness of a of a of a port. And um, as far as the uh, the palate goes, uh, is very light body all the way through for me. Um, is a little bit sweet on the front end, the middle, uh, the mid palate. That's where I kind of picked up some of the banana, and then near like near the end of the mid palate to the beginning of the fin of the finish. That's where I started to catch a little bit more smoke there. And really on my finish, I picked up uh, malt and charred oak. So that's kind of like what I, I got from it. Um, once again, I think, uh, you know, it's kind of like most of the ones that we've been tasting lately, I've been, I believe have been 43% ABV. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do think uh, maybe that you can definitely tell that there's a slight difference from the ones that we had compared to this one. This one's very good. It's very delicate. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure if I say delicate is the type of word there, but it, I mean, it does have some good complexity to it. It's not hot. So no. it's nice with that. Yeah, it's very, uh, it's very nice. Yeah, it's, I would say it's nice, has good flavor to it, light body. You know, some of the other ones we've had some like heavy bodies, some medium bodies, but this one's really nice, light, you know, light body. And I think it's, it's actually a really good, a good, uh, a good scotch, and I can see probably why they would utilize it for blending. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Which I think might be a little bit of a disservice to them because maybe they're That's not getting. That's what much, I'm talking about. Because <laughs> maybe they're not getting as much credit as they, as they right. should as a distillery. Yeah, no kidding. Like I call bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, color medium brass 
all the way. Uh, I, I like it. Um, not light. A lot. <laughs> um, not light. Not super brassy, but uh, medium brass, and, and I like it. Uh, the nose, man. Here's <laughs> where it gets fun. It is fruity and juicy, and like you mentioned, you absolutely get that scent of the port uh, oak cask that it, it's a uh, second maturation was done in the first and traditional oak um, and they're, they're reputed to use smoked barley uh, but with that man it is fruity and juicy to the level of like juicy fruit bubble gum when you get that fresh stick in your mouth it just pops and it's so fruity and that's really the nose I get on this it's no it's not uh, mild um, it's not complex it's complicated it's it's almost this uh, seesaw effect between the sweet fruits and the port the dry port uh, on the tongue the taste for me again complicated and I like that um, not mild at all but not so bold and hot because all you can taste is the alcohol the sweet fruits that I get in there um, I get almost a strawberry raspberry flavor, not jammy, but just again, these fruits, these juices that are coming through and then transcending um, into port, uh, a dry fruit. And I just get a teeny bit of smoke at the tail there. <laughs> That's what she said. Um, with, the, with the taste though, it's, it's great. Um, the finish for me is medium long. It's not super long, but it's definitely not short. And it is um, one where I do get mild notes of banana. And man, that what ultimately is going to be that peated barley and oak, um, that port oak. And I, I, I love it. It is. It's really good. And in fact, as you uh, were starting your, uh, your analysis there, I actually picked up some plum. Yeah. And I thought that was really great. Yeah. And I, and you know, she, uh, she's got a little bit of that banana flavor. I don't know that I've ever tasted it. You frequently mention banana as one of your tasting notes. Uh, that's I, more Brian <laughs> than it is me. Brian has like a, some kind of fetish with bananas. <laughs> but, but for the first time, I'm uh, getting a little bit of a uh, banana at the finish there. <laughs> uh, Brian, where are you? We need our banana expert. Yeah. This, this is uh banana from <laughs> the Brazilian fields of <laughs> <laughs> Santa de Luanda. <laughs> he likes his bananas. Yeah, he does. <laughs> uh, that's what he gets for ditching us. So. It's time for our shout outs. Um, I'm going to shout out to all of the directors the writers and the actors who have partaken in acting, writing, or directing um, our Smarter Challenge today, the different variations we have seen of Batman, the Dark Knight, and uh, Bruce Wayne, and uh, ultimately all the same person um, at different stages of his life and day, but some very different different uh, end results uh one is probably less controversial controversial than the other but the first one is going to be a shout out to the u.s truckers driving to uh dc to uh protest for uh freedom of choice when it comes to receiving a certain type of medication and lockdowns and things like that um to be there in time for uh, the absent-minded president's uh, State of the Union speech. And the other one, which is going to be a little bit more controversial, just depending upon how you view things and and some of the dots that one might put together. But um, if everything is true and the dots are pointing in the right direction and this person is a, a white hat who's been taking out bio uh, bioweapon labs and um, ending... Um, deep state money laundering type of things uh, and actually just truly trying to save the Ukrainian people, I will give a shout out to Putin. And if obviously if it proves to be wrong, then I will retract my shout out to Putin. But for now, from what I can tell from some of the uh, alternative news that's coming out, 
it seems that he's there to help out the Ukrainian people and try to free them from uh, the turmoil of the uh, deep state or new world order and some of the uh, bio labs and stuff like that. Yeah, you bring up a really good point, and I am truly glad you did, actually, because one of the things that I don't enjoy right now, it's really hard for me to watch any any news or media coverage of the Russian invasion on Ukraine, um, partially because I see the same building being blown up and burning down day after day after day and i don't know how which happens possible. to be like if you look at it like you do a web search it's like the same building from like some kind of explosion that happened in china i don't i don't know about that piece but it's been the same building i've seen every day um on the news and you know if this is like some war then where's the other buildings like why am i looking at the same building over and over and over again um, another piece is man i don't enjoy how the the press is and whoever is controlling the press whoever that might be <laughs> is controlling the press is trying to say that these sanctions and all these other actions that have been taken are really hurting russia's economy guess what boys and girls we were never afraid of <laughs> russia's economy like that wasn't the point we're afraid of their giant military force not their money so uh and I don't, what and Russia is not scared of sanctions either because when you have Europe, most of Europe who's buying oh, yeah, oil right. from Russia, all Russia has to do, and when a war occurs, there's going to be a shortage in supply. So they, all they have to do is just jack up the price on the oil, and Europe ends up funding the war anyway. Yeah, they're so they're paying <laughs> Putin to, to invade Ukraine. Just do the math. Like you guys keep an open mind here. Why is Biden trying to support this? Uh, well, let's not oil let's line. not let's not bring up like Biden's son, uh, <laughs> John Kerry's son, Pelosi's son, and uh, Mitt Romney's son, all being part of uh, oil or gas companies in the Ukraine. That is a little odd. And isn't it weird too that when the prosecutor general uh in ukraine was investigating burisma which happens to be on the uh where hunter biden sat as a one of the board of directors they were being investigated and this was during obama's era and uh, joe and joe biden was there and he uh threatened to withhold foreign aid to Ukraine unless they fired the Secretary General. Uh, back to my shout out, which might be somewhat controversial. It is for Putin, assuming that he is a white hat and he's doing the, the good for the people. So this evening, we ventured to the tailgate in Parker. Giddy up, giddy up. <laughs> um, and it was a pleasant surprise. It was. I enjoyed the place, actually. It was cool. It was fun. I can see um, I can see it being a fun place to take a date, to go with a friend, to have a good time. You don't dress up. I wouldn't say it's a semi-formal or formal place, but you wouldn't be so out of place just in a dinner jacket um, no, or no. a blazer. And good music. That everyone who was there was having a blast. Yeah, they were. I mean, you got what, a table like two down from us. They were just like singing along with songs and all. all kinds yeah, of I was kind of glad when they shut up, though. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> they were singing all the wrong songs for me. I'm like, oh, come on. Really? <laughs> a decent spirit selection. Yes. Um, an, an, an okay draft selection. Um, yeah, yeah. So not bad there. And then the food. So we started oh. with chili cheese fries. We have to go there. I, I know, not fries, tots. Chili cheese tots, that's right. Started with chili <laughs> cheese tots because we've had some rave reviews from other locations in the past. And, man, when they were delivered, wasn't so impressed. No, they were not very <laughs> impressive looking at all. However, ah. <laughs> even though they were very uh, meek looking, yeah. Yeah. 
they actually had a lot of great flavor to it. Yeah, dude, that skinny little 50 pound kid could run. <laughs> <laughs> they did. They were literally chili. <laughs> little, little, little 50 pound kid that's yeah. being chased by a leopard. Yeah. How did he outrun the leopard? I don't know, but the leopard's <laughs> over there exhausted. That was me trying to finish these tots. <laughs> <laughs> So chili, <laughs> green chili, cheddar <laughs> cheese on top of tots. Tots were cooked perfectly. The chili was great. The cheese was good. And it was surprisingly. And after, and after, after the leopard was all, all exhausted, you offer him some tots? No way, man. The mine. The mine tots. <laughs> Nonetheless. Decent size plate, seven ninety nine. They were finished. They, none hey, of them were left behind. No, they none of them were. No tots left behind. No tots left behind. Uh, again, so at the end, they were super impressive <laughs> for its flavor, and you got exactly what they described, which was perfect. Like, they, 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 yeah, they described perfect. it perfectly, and then he comes out. You're like, oh, uh, okay, it's exactly what they said. But then when you taste it, I'm like. Oh, this actually tastes pretty good. Yeah. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> That's the best cookie I ever had. Mm. <laughs> good. That ain't no regular cracker. <laughs> <laughs> they were delicious. <laughs> I proceeded um, to have uh, the New Yorker burger, which has a little bit of uh, sauerkraut, a, a little bit of um, shaved... Corned beef, uh, Swiss cheese, the buns were perfect, a uh, nice slice of fresh red onion that I placed upon mine. Uh, the burger was also amazing. And what was really amazing, this burger's 12 bucks. And on Mondays, it's half price burger day. So this burger was less expensive than a, a burger I could get in McDonald's. <laughs> and it was delish. It was flipping delish. amazing. <laughs> like, it was amazing. Man, it's like go back Monday thing. Like, this yeah. Is, normally, I'm not like, yeah, you got to go back and try it out. It's happy hour. You just go back. <laughs> I want to try every one of the, I think it was 12 burgers on that list. Yeah. Uh, I will. I agree. I think, well. We stumbled into it because we were searching for a uh, a restaurant to go to for this evening. Uh, I'm good right now, and uh, and we picked the, the the tailgate. And when we got there, we were looking at the menu and everything like that. And it was like a total win. We're like, "Oh, hey, check this out! Monday special, half off burgers." We're like, "All right, well, I guess I'm gonna get a burger." And it wasn't like a twenty dollar burger. It yeah, was like twelve, thirteen bucks. Exactly. And and uh, the nice thing with me, uh, we're like, well, well with with me choosing a burger, I normally go with like a barbecue bacon burger, but I, I saw like a, a, a Swiss burger on there with, you know, the sauteed mushrooms. I'm like, I haven't had one of these in a long time. So I got that and I swapped out regular Angus beef for the bison burger. And man, it was so delicious. The one, my one little like, and this is not really a big complaint, but it's just a slight little one is I would have preferred to have a Dijon mustard rather than yeah. just a regular mustard. But the waitress was like super nice and super like upbeat and cheery. Um, I seemed to, it seemed a little bit weird. I think she said she doesn't drink and she works in a pub. But yeah. <laughs> she's like, "Do you do you understand? I just don't want to drink." I'm like, "No, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand. I have a podcast yeah. where we drink alcohol. And we what talk kind of about drugs. <laughs> are you doing that you don't want to do alcohol?" <laughs> <laughs> but no, she's like I, the wait staff. Like they're very prompt. It came over quite a bit to make sure we're okay. Um, the burger was fabulous. Oh man, uh, the fries. Even though I, I, I even ate all my fries. I probably shouldn't have, but I did. But they were like beer battered fries, and they tasted so good. They were also amazing, especially with just a little teeny bit of ketchup. And I did not finish mine only because I had to save room for this delicious scotch. Um. I actually preferred mine without the ketchup. Did you? Yeah. I think it had more flavor without the ketchup. But in any case, I did end up like dipping some in ketchup, some of them. But uh, the mass majority I ate was like without the ketchup. And I really enjoyed it without. Yeah. Any case, uh, well, I keep always saying any case. <laughs> in every case. <laughs> in every case. I will say this, though. Um, if you are looking for a good burger and you're in the Parker area on a Monday, especially on a Monday, 
Go to uh, the tailgate. They have uh, some incredible burgers, at least the two that we tried. We both liked a lot. There's a couple more on there I'd like to try. However, we film on Mondays, and we usually go to a new restaurant every time, so I'm not sure when the next time is we'll be able to go back and visit them. We'll make time. We'll make, make time. time. <laughs> She's important. We make time for her. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I do give, I think it is date-worthy, like you said. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great place to hang out with buddies. Um you know, like it's it's kind of a low key place as far as to go like for a date or something like that. Some not a place you're gonna really you don't really have to dress up. You could, but I don't think you really need to there. And uh, it's just a, like a really good fun place. So, like as you mentioned, a lot of people were having fun there. It's very light hearted. Um, they play great music there. Yeah. So um, I would say, uh, ambiance wise. It's like your standard pub. I said I'd give it probably like a six, but uh, the wait staff, the food, all of that, I think is enough to offset it to give me to give them a total uh, like a total level of like an eight. Yeah, uh, for me, environment, atmosphere, inside a six. I'd like to go back during the summer sometime. They have that giant patio with all the fire pits. That Enjoy might that, that might bump evening. it up. That could bump it up. Uh, but for me, the service was a seven, which was good. Um, the food was a was was an eight and a half, almost nine. Um, and then value wise, you go on any given day, it's going to be an eight. You go when <laughs> they're having one of their specials and they have specials every day. Um, wings, for example, on Tuesdays. Oh, those wings things. look great they, on that table next to us. They did look good. Um, you, you take advantage of that. You're probably talking a 9.5, if not a 10 for value. Um, I can't remember. I was such a, the last time I was such a cheap date, dude. I got out for <laughs> $19 with tip. <laughs> <laughs> That's including alcohol. Oh. Yeah, that's with the beer. <laughs> like, seriously, uh, I've never had a date that cheap. Not <laughs> even in high school, which was only a couple years ago. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great. Um, definitely date worthy. Definitely friend worthy. Have fun. Um, definitely noisy a little bit later as you get into the night. Are you ready to rumble? Oh, yeah. The best of Batman. That's right. Well, as we jump into this week's Smarter Challenge and uh, the best of Batman, I'm going to give a little brief history on Batman. Um, and if you can use your thinker, um, think about how war times might have played into a little bit about his development. So uh, Batman was originally a superhero created by artist Bob Kane and writer Bill Finger. I don't know if I like that name. Uh, debuted in the 20 She liked it. Yeah, debuted in the 27th issue of Detective Comics on March 30th of 1939. Uh, De Detective Comics is the longest running comic book in the United States. So that's pretty impressive. Originally introduced as a ruthless vigilante who frequently killed or maimed criminals and then evolved later through his own development and ultimately popularity as a character um, into a character with a stringent moral code and strong sense of justice. Uh, the Batman TV series used a camp aesthetic in the 1960s and it really only ran for two years and three months. Pow! Yeah, exactly. Bang! Yeah, ridiculously Boom! colored clothes, all that stuff. Like, So really played on the aesthetic of being uh, obscene, if you will, uh, uh, profound, exaggerated. Pow! You know, bing! <laughs> um, and Batman was played by Adam West. So this is one of the, the Batman characters. You know, if I go ask my mom who her favorite Batman actor was. Adam West. I uh, think women just liked him. I do, too. He's kind of like the original Superman. I should say older women just liked him. I'm not sure like, I'm not sure like a 20-year-old like a 20 20 year girl would be like, or a woman would be like, yeah, I like Adam West. I don't know. He's dead, so he's always <laughs> stiff. <laughs> that is stiff competition there. Yeah. I don't know if uh, the newer Batmans can keep it up like he can. <laughs> Creators work to return Batman to his darker roots. The blue pill for him. <laughs> in the 70s and 80s, which culminated in a mini the miniseries The Dark Knight Returns 
by Frank Miller in 1986. Um, a little bit about Frank Miller and his history. Um, he has written comics. Uh, he has written screenplays. He's directed. He's done producing. Um, some of his works include Daredevil, The Dark Knight Returns, Sin City, and 300. All some of my favorite action uh, movies writing this um, is Spartan. yeah you don't mess with the spartan women in particular <laughs> seriously so 1960s for a couple of years adam west portrayed batman in the tv series uh which was really literally it's two years and three months that he was this um in 1989 batman was played by michael keaton keaton and also in 1992 in batman returns um Fun fact about that one, which you can see if you think about his other works, Tim Burton directed those two films. And you can absolutely see it in the way he portrays the Joker and the Penguin and some of the other characters. Uh, 1995, a Batman Forever, played by Val Kilmer. 1997, Batman and Robin, where Batman was played by George Clooney. These films, um, directed by Joel Schumacher, were not received well in the masses of the public. Um, not to say that they didn't do a decent job. Uh, George Clooney definitely didn't do a decent job. But uh, definitely not the Batman people were looking for in the late 90s. Um, then you get, you know, you jump forward nine more years and you get Batman Begins in 2005, The Dark Knight in 2012, and then The Dark Knight Rises. Um, and so 2008, 2012 for the final one. And these were done by Chris Nolan, who he himself and um, Christian Bale stopped in this series of movies, even though I believe they did both plan originally um, after a very tragic event in our own Colorado history. So um, with that, you jump into Ben Affleck and his role as Batman. I don't think he did a terrible job. 2016 in Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice, and then again in Justice League in 2017. Zack Snyder, you didn't even put the director's name there. Yeah, I wasn't so, yeah. I don't know. Actually, Zack Snyder, I will say. Um, well, he did. Well, there's a Snyder cut, I guess you should say, for the uh, Justice League, which he had some kind of like uh, uh, some kind of family issue or something like that that popped up to where he couldn't finish Justice League. So, uh, jo is it Josh Wheaton or something like that? He came in and uh, finished up the Justice League. So it wasn't really the Justice League that should have been. Uh, well, put out the theaters. Wanted, yeah. So then he went back in, and if you go on to HBO, they actually have the Snyder cut, and that is actually way better, way longer, but way better. <laughs> it it's was four hours long. That's a pretty long movie. Um, with that though, we've got the new one coming out next week. The Batman, played by Robert Pattinson. Um both excited and scared to see how this one pans out um direct, directed by matt reeves who i mean really his bigger notable works for me were dawn of the planet of the apes in 2014 and then war for the planet of the apes in 2017. all right so i guess this takes us and uh I really can't mention anything about comic books because I never really read comic books. Really, the one piece I would note, and is if you go back and you think about some of the ties here, um, Batman in the comic books evolved much as he has in the movies. He's gone from uh, originally played, I think, by Michael Keaton. If you look, if you jump into that sector with uh, Tim Burton's directing, uh, almost playful, almost. Uh, enlightened um, light-hearted uh, versus at the end of Christian Bale's reign and then especially Ben Affleck's a little bit darker um, the comic books were no different and so that's really where the dark oh, sure you said like the like in the history there he started off as like killing people so I'm not sure he was like super playful in the beginning no 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 but in <laughs> in most of his history he started out like if you really want to break it down he started out as the Punisher I don't think he was going to be super popular <laughs> he started out as the Punisher in detective comics is a bad guy and a, a vigilante who was literally going around maiming people we're not talking about slapping them hurting their feelings breaking on maiming 
maiming them and killing them um, and then gain some popularity. But as is truthfully the case, you can't have some totally negative hero. So he has to all of a sudden have a code, if not a moral code, and then it has to be pretty strict with that. Um, but with that, in the movies, you see the same thing with Michael Keaton. You got this version um, played much like Adam West, where it's kind of playful and then it goes very dark very quickly as life can have that effect on people all right so who's your favorite batman out of the movies oh man um as far as the comic books my wrap up there is the dark knight series when it did truly go to the dark knight i was in uh well i was much younger and with that uh, I my one of my favorite scenes of those comic books was the Batman. I'll never forget the Batman holding a criminal off of a bridge, and the the criminal's like, "What? Let me go! Let me go!" And Batman's like, "I'll let you go if you tell me what I need to know." And the criminal tells him, and then the criminal says, "Come on, man! You said I'd let you go." And he's like, "Here you go!" And he just drops him off the bridge. Guy clearly did not survive, <laughs> but he kept his word. Stick to his code. So as far as that, my best Batman for me, I actually think Ben Affleck did a really nice job transitioning from Christian Bale into the Justice League or Batman versus Superman, um, playing the role the way he did. I understand politically why he was, if you will say, not received well, um, but... It's, it is Christian Bale was my favorite actor for the Batman. And you often use the term arc. I think it's a very popular arc, um, you know, where you've got somebody who loses everything and then has to gain it and then loses it again and then finds, you know, their destiny, if you will, the hero tale. And he does a really nice job acting throughout he, he really did in particular for me um the way he is broken but then refines a purpose in life or life at all in in the batman rises uh man he did a great job how about yourself favorite batman well here i think it's a little bit tough to kind of the only one that really had like kind of a character arc all the way through is christian bill uh because if you really look at like michael keaton he only had what two two films uh, and then Ben Affleck had two films, but really his two films weren't just Batman. Uh, George Clooney had one to himself. Al Kilmer had one to himself. So I don't think a lot of them really gave you like a whole total like character arc or showing the buildup of like how Batman or Bruce, Bruce Wayne evolves over time. But in the, uh, short amount of stuff that that we have to work with um even though he may have been unpopular uh, i do think one of the better actors who played the bruce wayne part of batman would be ben affleck and i think he did a really good job mm -hmm. um i think he did a great job as uh, as batman too although he his i think the way his like maybe it's the way his costume was but he didn't seem as as mobile some of the as the other ones but it could also be too though i think um when you see ben affleck in his character as uh, bruce wayne and uh and batman i think he's like a little bit of an older 50s uh an older batman so that would that could would kind of pertain to him maybe moving a little bit slower or having a little be a little bit more stiffer um after him though i would say i probably would have to give it to uh uh, to Christian Bell because you do get to see a whole arc from from the time that he leaves uh, and and gets trained as Batman uh, with the with the League of Shadows all all the way to when he um, uh, when you have the uh, the rise of the Dark or Dark Knight Rises I think is that what it, is that what the last one Dark Knight Rises yeah yeah so I think you get a good character arc there because it kind of finishes off at the end where he meets Alfred's kind of like thought or goal. It's not like explicit that he does it, but you kind of get the hand at the end that he's at the cafe that, that Alfred has, you know, said that he wanted to see mm -hmm. um, Bruce Wayne out with, with a woman. Absolutely. So I, I think you have a really like, if you're going to look at like which, which one of them gives you the best, like start to finish, that's going to be Christian bill. Uh, one time performance or possible two-time performance, I go with uh, Christian Bell, even though I think a lot of people 
believe uh, Michael Keaton is their favorite because I've heard a lot of people say they like Michael oh, Keaton. Yeah, as, they as love as him. A, yeah. And Tim Burton did a great job. And to your point, I think maybe it's more important to consider which of the directors, therefore, did the better job as much as portraying Batman with an actor, but also how they directed that actor um, in Batman the Begins with Christian Bale, you see a man transform. You don't have to have the whole series of all three. You do not see that in either of the Michael Keaton movies. You don't see that with Val right. Kilmer, George Clooney, or even Ben Affleck. But I do think Ben Affleck, man, he had uh, really tough shoes to fill. And uh, again, I, I think hats off to him. He did a great job. Um, I, I would like to see him continue that role, although I think they have different plans um, but the same thing with the Dark Knight Rises. Your whether or not you had seen anything else, you see this man broken and rebuilt. Yeah, and I think you're you're absolutely onto something here because, like, when you look at Tim Burton, like a lot. Of, if you look at a lot of his work, it's more like on the macabre type of side of things, where and a lot more like playful, cartoony ish. And when you watch, and I think this is why maybe people like Michael Keaton a lot is because when his Batman version came out to the theaters, it was like a big event. And oh, uh, yeah. and it had the comic book feel to it. Um, it didn't seem as like dark and gritty, but more like, I mean, it, there was definitely some darkness to it, but um, it, it just had like a little bit more of a comic book feel, uh, like, like a comic book coming to life, if you will. Whereas if you watch like... Uh, you know um, the dark knight series yeah batman begins more of a dark graphic Man. novel yeah exactly and then when you look at the justice league that's almost kind of more like a you know batman versus superman and then the justice league that's more of a graphic novel too yeah um it, it is a really good point and to your point as well michael keaton batman late 80s uh that is at the peak of comic book popularity um in particular the peak of the anti-social um psychotic anti-heroes or villains vigilantes the punisher and others that's when they were super popular so the movie yeah i think did have a role with that as well all right um your favorite movie oh yeah for me favorite movie for sure the dark knight rises that one was uh, after revisiting all of them all of the, uh the the movies not the tv shows but after revisiting the movies um it reminded me for so many reasons why it's my favorite and really it is that piece where it inspires it engages it um enthralls me to pray that there are still people of this character of bruce wayne's character the way he played it uh you know i think about war or anything else i want that guy to be the one fighting for me um that is a it is a good movie because you get like even more of like uh you get you originally get the arc from that series but then you get like a little sub arc in there mm -hmm. uh where he's where he's already kind of climbed the top of the mountain, got gets knocked down and climbs back up again. So it gives you that whole like uh, underdog kind of feel again to him. Uh, I think that's a that's a great movie. Uh, my favorite though. Oh man, tell me, I can't wait. Is going to be the Dark Knight. <laughs> I, I can't and, fault you. I literally can't <laughs> fault you. I'm going to show you a magic trick. I'm going to make this pistol disappear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a good trick because here's the thing right Heath Ledger oh my god he was like I remember seeing the pictures of him as the Joker I'm like oh man this is gonna be a terrible Joker and when I saw the movie I'm like OMG like he just played the Joker to the T like he was such an incredible Joker and he really stole the show like yeah, there was like a Two Face in there, Harvey, like uh, Harvey Dent, and that that guy, like he's okay, um, but really, I think the acting from Heath Ledger, uh, like, he, I think he did such a phenomenal job. Like, he really stole the show, and uh, I think he outperformed uh, Christian Bell. But even with Christian Bell being the Dark Knight, there, I mean, you could just they really played off each other well, and I just honestly really enjoyed that movie so much. So that's my number one. All right. Do you want to roll that right into your favorite villain? 
<laughs> Favorite villain, the Joker. <laughs> and more particularly, when I'm talking about the Joker, I'm going to say Heath Ledger. The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight. Yep. Yeah, gotcha. And uh, <laughs> honestly, if, if, if too bad what happened to Heath Ledger happened, because I would have loved him to reprise the, the role and and continue to do the Joker because he did such an incredible job as a Joker. As a close runner-up, though, I will say Mark Hamill with all of his animation and the video games uh, where he voiced the Joker because I think he does a great job being the Joker, and he's done it like multiple, multiple times. Yeah. So, yeah, Joker is my best villain, I guess. So, for me, this is a tough one. So Heath Ledger does an amazing job in The Dark Knight from 2008. By far the best Joker ever played in my mind. However, you got to give Jack Nicholson some credit for his role in 1989 for the way he portrayed it. Um, Because what it is that Heath Ledger did and ultimately what what made the Joker movie itself, the standalone, so possible was you had to understand the Joker's crazy. Like this is guy. This is a guy who's insane, but he's also got something in him that's ticking just enough to make a plan and to make that plan a successful or potentially successful strategy to to wreak havoc uh, and destroy so much in his way. Um, man, Tom Hardy does an amazing job. He as does Bane. good. Bane. He does good. And Liam Neeson. Yeah, he did a fabulous job as Raj Ghoul or Henry Ducard. I like to, when I was thinking about who's the, the most, which is the villain that's the best to me, I take a little bit of thought and, and I look at the timeline from Raj Ghoul as his role in Batman Begins 2005. And then you jump back and you skip this whole movie with the Dark Knight where the Joker comes into play to 2012, the Dark Knight Rises. And it kind of reminds me of this uh, usual suspects, Kaiser Soze type of feeling where I'm like, man, this is someone as a criminal who doesn't fail. And so in an probably unfathomable to most people. Miranda Tate, Talia Agul, Ra Agul's daughter, played by Marion Cotillard, is by far the best villain to me. And why she is the best villain. This is something that's so interesting. She's your best villain? She is the best villain. Here's why. She was written and acted the role flawlessly. She's this close to Batman to everyone who trusts that she's trying to save Gotham and she's the one that's destroying it. She's the one with all the power. This is what's scary to me. This is people who who might, I don't know, elect a president and don't realize the evil that someone's capable of who put a person in a position of power. Biden. I don't know. What did he do that too? <laughs> But for people who put, I know what you mean. For people who put someone in a position of power, this is what scares me. The Joker, crazy guy. Yeah, scary, going to do some bad. That doesn't scare me. People like this are what scare me because they are world enders. They are society enders. And like you bring up a good point. I don't know who's currently running this country, but they're running it into the ground. It's hard to think that they weren't doing that intentionally. Meanwhile, yeah, vote for me, elect me. I want to save America. Uh, what? <laughs> Where, when does it happen? Where is this pencil going to disappear? <laughs> Here's the funny part. You're saying like her who gets really close to Batman or to Bruce Wayne and all that. I mean, she seems like the good I mean, person. She gets close enough that he's inside of her. <laughs> <laughs> she seems like a good person, but in, in, in actuality, she's destroying the city. That's but on I the mean. flip side, you have the total crazy guy, the Joker, and actually, he probably makes more sense than any of them. That's my point. That's the Joker doesn't scare me. I understand that he has a problem with something, <laughs> but he's right about society, though. 
I mean, then maybe POTUS isn't doing anything wrong currently. <laughs> no, talk, like, you look at the Joker when he talks about in the Dark Knight and how he questions society. And really, he's he's not totally wrong with how our society is when he's questioning. Dude, POTUS, in term, to your point. <laughs> No, I, I don't disagree with you, but that's what scares me. That's what keeps me up at night. Isn't the people who are crazy, who are doing sick things. Um, that doesn't make me happy. That doesn't make me sleep well, but it doesn't keep me up at night. What keeps me up at night are these people who are truly doing devious things, but are able to come this close and the average person would never know it. Welcome to American politics. I know that's, that doesn't keep me give me very good sleep any, right now. I, I'm not kidding. How like, how old you are? You've lived with it this long. I mean, yeah, but uh, even the the previous presidents I didn't trust uh, didn't do this. Like <laughs> this is scary to me. But anyway, yeah, she's the one. She's the one who uh, scares me. People right. like that. All right. Okay, who's who's the worst? Villain. Sorry, it's not on your list here that you gave us. Who's who's the worst villain? All right. <laughs> we got to throw it out there. For me, Mr. Freeze, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yes. <laughs> That's who I was going to And pick. I love him, man. He's so, particularly in that time frame, <laughs> the Terminator, Commando, all these movies where he is just the... <laughs> Mr. Freeze was so terrible. <laughs> he was the worst. Was, was that the George Clooney movie or was that uh, Val Clooney. Kilmer? Clooney. All right, because, like, I think, honestly, uh, which one, who did Val Kilmer have to go up against? Man, I don't even remember. I think that's part of it, though. Like, the directors do or don't make a villain memorable, depending on where you are in your life and the scape, the landscape, when I say the scape. Um, and I think that was part of the tragedy of Val Kilmer is I didn't think he developed a great Bruce Wayne. I thought he played a decent Batman, but he was utterly forgettable to me. See, and I think... Val Kilmer could have been one of those ones that if he was given like two or three movies, it would have shown how good of a Batman he could have been. Uh, just like I think Ben Affleck probably deserved another, like or either a solo movie or another another round. But here's the lesson, boys and girls. Listen to our restaurant reviews. Make sure you got the <laughs> right setting. Make sure you got the right directors. So when you go in, if you wanted a first date and you think you want a second or third, you get a chance. Unlike Val Kilmer or George Clooney. <laughs> and really, like, uh, and then hope that like no, like no family issues or something pops up so you can get another second one. Because I think uh, if you look at what Zack Snyder had planned out for his whole art uh, arc of a story. It was going to be like, I think it's like three or four movies uh, of an arc or maybe five for the, the DC universe. And it was going to play out pretty well. And I think uh, if all the actors and everything would have stayed on board with it, and if the producers would have gone with it, they, they would have been great, but here's the problem. And I think this is why I like a lot about Batman versus Superman is that it was, is uh, the, the studio said it was too dark and I think, and I think it was gritty and dark enough. No, I, th I thought it was perfect. And when we talk about Superman and Batman and their origins, Superman was introduced into this world just nine months prior to Batman in comic books. Nine months. We're talking about a, a June to a Jul a March of the following year. Um, that's pretty impressive. Like. Uh, so that's what really makes me think like think about your history and your timelines what was the world going through that they needed a true hero and a uh, vigilante i think well i think if, if you look at 39 like a lot of those people were probably reading comic books at that time they lived um through the great depression so yeah like the like the roaring 20s a little bit too so yeah like all, like you know yeah. we have all the gangsters running around shooting up things and yeah, why wouldn't you have a vigilante? Yeah, June in 1938, Superman. We're hoping that the good guy is going to save the day. And then at the end, March of 39, you, know, you need your vigilante. Batman, but, some, here some, comes. but sometimes you, you don't need the good guy. You, you need the guy who's going to get himself dirty like that. And uh, that kind of reminds me of the, uh, what was it, The Dark Knight Returns? Is that that one that uh, Frank Miller wrote? Yes. 
Yeah, so I didn't. Yeah. I've never read that comic book, but I saw the ad, the adaptation that they did uh, for the animated uh, movies. Mm-hmm. It was t- a two part series, and yeah, he like Superman's like he obeys the government, and like uh, the Justice League was disbanded, and the one city when uh, a nuclear bomb goes off or whatever, and it turns off like basically it's like an EMP that goes off over all of the United States. All the cities go into turmoil except for. Gotham. Gotham. And uh and then after that, uh, the president at the time who was who was supposedly Reagan in, in this cartoon sends Superman to go kill Batman. And Batman did the right thing. I didn't say he didn't do the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say you did. I'm just saying, like, you know, sometimes the vigilante is the right answer, even though it's the wrong answer. <laughs> It can never be the right answer, but it's just not ro- the wrong answer. So read between the lines. <laughs> it was the right That's answer. That's what she said. <laughs> Anyhow, okay. Favorite Catwoman. Yeah. All right, what you got? What, what do I got? Oh, you want me to go? No, I can go. Just give me a second here. All right. Here we go. You're thinking Eartha Kit? This is going to be my favorite Catwoman right here. Oh. Kim Basinger? Five for that white gold. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go with Michelle Pfeiffer. That Michael white gold. Keaton, Tim Burton, Jack Nicholson. Song played in the museum where Jack Nicholson destroys all the art. That's not that song. Yeah, it is. That's not. Is it? No, that's uh, Uptown Funk. Okay. By Bruno Mars. All right. Quite a few later. Quite a few years later. It's, a, it's pretty close evolution. <laughs> Do you remember that song? Yeah, okay. in, in fact, that was uh, that was done by Prince, and yes. that, that was going to be my favorite song for nice. this uh, for like uh, the movies. There. All right, but in any case, yeah, I, I I'll go with Michelle Pfeiffer. I know her her original character before she becomes uh, <laughs> the Catwoman is a little bit uh, <laughs> a little bit on the uh, annoying side, but uh, I think she ended up doing a pretty good one. And honestly, if I really wanted to. If, if we update things and stuff like that, I mean, yeah, I think Michelle Fiverr was good for her time. And then, um, uh, dang, I forgot her name. Anne Hathaway. She did an awesome job, too, Anne Hathaway. But the, my problem with Anne Hathaway, and I think this is my problem with a lot of movies that, that have come out lately, is I just had just a little bit too much of uh, social justice warrior stuff going on there for me. I mean, Anne Hathaway, at the end of the day, was my favorite Catwoman. And I just thought she played the role the way a cat would play the role, smart. And, man, I don't like cats. I'm just saying. Like, I think Michelle Pfeiffer played my version of a cat flawlessly. <laughs> Crazy, yeah, boo, kick it off a building. Just kidding, I wouldn't do that. Uh, but uh, she was my favorite Catwoman now. But here's where it gets interesting because the next one is uh, favorite quotes or quote. Um, Jack Nicholson for me here. Dude, so for me, this one is the one time I want to kick back to the TV series, the TV show Eartha Kit plays Catwoman. And Eartha Kit's quote, and this is this is so perfect. It literally is perfect. Her quote is, you'd better... Pray, Batman is a man man more than he's a policeman. This was in episode 14 from 1967. You better pray, Batman is you remember a man that from man the TV series more than he's a policeman. Dude, there are some quotes you literally cannot forget. And this is the point, though. Um, you literally just said it. Sometimes you need a vigilante, right? You'd better pray. Batman is a man, man, more than he's a policeman. Dude, th- okay. you don't get a better quote. Well, I guess my <laughs> quote, one of my favorite quotes, actually comes from a villain as well. Oh, well, Catwoman wasn't totally a villain. <laughs> but mine is, uh, never rub another man's rhubarb. <laughs> he's talking about the vegetable. Or is it a fruit? <laughs> <laughs> Jack Nicholson, the Joker. That's a good the, one. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why, but that was always that that, that one's always uh, that one's always hung around. Yeah, the other one that really has always stuck with me is when Liam Neeson's character 
is fighting training Bruce Wayne, Christian Bale on the ice. And Christian Bale says, I failed, blah, blah, blah. Could be any number of things, but I failed. And Liam Nation's character says, no, your father failed. And that's another one that always sticks with me, especially once you have kids, is because you are responsible for some basics. And at the end of the day, you don't necessarily guarantee or deny your kids success by training them or teaching them or gifting them certain lessons in life. But you better believe um, if by giving them some of those lessons, you can benefit them. So my other one, my other favorite uh, quote, and I'm probably going to misquote it because I didn't write it down. But it does come from the Dark Knight. It's from Alfred. And uh, he's talking to Bruce Wayne about the Joker. And he was uh, telling him about some kind of experience that he had with some uh, people like when he was uh, in battle or in the army or something like that. And he said that uh, some men just want to see the world burn. Yeah, that's true. And I think it's totally true. I mean, look at today's times, right? I mean, there's obviously people who are destroying the world and they're just and they're doing it. You know, for whatever reason, they just want to see the world burn. Yeah. All right. Any so, any hero, superhero better than Batman? Man, so here's where, you know, it is interesting. Um, and I think to your point, when you talk about the later two, the last two movies, really before this new evolution of the Batman, um, Justice League, Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice, you get an opportunity to really see both sides of humanity. And when you're talking about a better person, when it comes to who's an actual better code or better morality, it's absolutely Superman. He's the one person that is a better hero than anyone. And here's where it gets tricky is. And here's, I don't think so. Dude, here's where, I know where you're going, but you're wrong. Here's where it gets tricky is this guy's not human. He is literally the guy who saves humanity time after time after time, and he's not even human. Um, you're thinking, okay, well, Batman beats Superman. Batman's only ever ability to beat Superman was one on one by. No, that's not what I'm saying. Like he's he would be the better one. I'm just saying that that's not. I don't think that's necessarily the truth. All right, I'm saying morality. Better is in morality as far as who gets the job done by not doing wrong. Superman's the one other person. There are lots of good heroes, um, but most heroes break things by fixing the ones they want to, and I, that's the one thing where I think Superman, even though the government hates him and ultimately controls him that Superman doesn't break a code where I think of Batman and a lot of others, and not that they're breaking their code, but they, their morality is a little different. See, and he, here's where I think Batman might be better than Superman because I think he looks at all factors and he critically thinks about things and he plans for them. Like he, he sees Superman and he knows that there's a possibility for how strong Superman is that if he does, he, he, if he decides not to be benevolent anymore, you need to have a plan of how to destroy him. And likewise, I, I forget which one it is, but it's one of the animation uh, mm -hmm. movies. But Batman goes through, and for all the all the members of Justice League, he has a file on how yeah. to defeat all of them, including himself. Yeah. It'd be one thing if uh, Batman did not include himself in that, but he did. He included how to defeat himself as well. Well, the reason he has the file, if you read all the comic books about how to defeat himself, is so he knows how anyone else might possibly come after him. It's really not giving any credence to this is how he would get defeated or how someone could defeat him. It's how he can avoid being defeated because that's the <laughs> way they might possibly defeat him. Um, but, yeah. I, I, mean, I hear what you're saying about the Batman doing that, but in doing that, he also blindsides. And if you look at just the most recent two movies, he literally creates the weapon um, that creates a situation where Superman 
and also another villain can be killed but his whole goal was to kill <laughs> superman who ultimately he ends up bringing back to but life I think he <laughs> because he didn't foresee the real threat the real threat was not superman the real threat was whatever else is out there is evil like superman i i mean i don't i don't think i can fault him where he goes like if there's a one percent chance that he's evil that we have to like take our shot at him if, if need be take him out before he takes us all out that's the the flaw though is that it's there's a chance and so when you start looking at that you start walking down the street and you're playing judge jury and executioner and everyone you look at that you don't like the way they look or they act you shoot them because but he is a vigilante there's though. a one percent <laughs> chance this guy might go crazy and hurt a dog there's a one percent chance. yeah but you have to look at like what happened there this is like after the battle between superman and uh general zod so i mean yeah like these aliens coming in destroying much of the earth and stuff like that and in this case you know you could see where he, his thought process is and trying to like rid the earth of superman so therefore like you don't have these other non-humans coming to, to earth i I don't, I don't really fault the guy but i think <laughs> i think here i think you have to kind of look at a couple different things so because with superman if you're just a pure Boy Scout, pure and through and through, I think ideally everyone thinks like that would be their, the best thing ever. But those people can be easily manipulated too. And when they're easily manipulated, their innocence or their so-called code can be used against them to, to, to actually do more harm than good. Whereas if you have someone like Batman... Not saying like his... Like he has a good, strong moral code too. I mean, he, he follows his own code. It just may not be the right code all the time for <laughs> for society, and uh, I think they both have pros and cons. Um, and uh, that's the only reason why I think I would choose uh, Batman over Superman is because even though he, he his code may not be right all the time, at least he's not totally blind to when uh, when you have to break from society to make to to make a right judgment call. I mean, you can be wrong and right at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Tell that to your test taker. <laughs> yeah, you see wrong, I see right. <laughs> uh, I think there's a definite ebb and flow of that there was Just a place, a there is a need for people like Batman to be heroes too. Um, to me though, when it, and, and I, it sucks. Because the truth of the matter is, Superman never makes a gamble on anyone's life unless yeah, he, does. he sees a threat that is real, not there's a 1% chance there's a threat. Yeah, come on. He'll go and save uh, whatever his girl's name before like some other like random show is in trouble. That, but that's not see that you're sounding like the U.S. government in the movies now. But we didn't have control over who you saved or didn't save. What made her life worth more? You still saved a life. You didn't take anyone's life that wasn't putting a life in danger. That wasn't doing wrong. You just weren't controlled. So to that point, he wasn't controlled. And just like the Batman, he's making his own choices, deciding what to do and what not to do. I agree with you. The Batman has a place. Um, but to me, the better hero ultimately is Superman. The tragedy is none of us will ever be him because we're all human. He was and is not. I think uh, that's why he's easy to hate. Who? Superman. That's why so many people hate him and they want the Batman. They want the human to win because he's human. Superman's an alien. I have no problem with aliens, by the way, unless they're illegal. <laughs> Technically, wouldn't he be illegal? <laughs> no, man. The guy had a passport and a mommy and a daddy in Kansas. <laughs> uh, but he didn't need a passport. I think when you. What you probably do need, if we're if we want to be really kind of realistic, you do need to have the light side and the dark side. Really, honestly, I don't. I mean, I hear what you're saying, and I think that's what humans want. I think that's why men love their conspiracy theories more than some women love their soap operas. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because honestly, you want to have try to keep everything above board, but here's here's the reality, right? 
sometimes you can't have everything above board because if everyone knew everything, then I'm, it might cause more harm than good. Yeah, all you have to do is watch our last few podcasts and you <laughs> see that. But then you get into the tricky situation was with this, was the CIA or the FBI wrong? I think they were wrong. But. <laughs> well, but not everyone can have all the information. See, that's a slippery slope. Once you break that morality. But I, I think I think the CIA and the FBI already broke that morality. For sure. I think you have to have, like. Hence the dark night. I think we go. Batman does it too. Batman decides who to kill, even though they shouldn't have necessarily been killed in the dark night. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying when it comes to being more moral, it's Superman. I'm going to give it a toss up. All right. Dude, it's morals. It's not a toss up. Batman killed at a whim during the Dark Knight series. I'm not saying he was wrong. He just didn't even find out if he was right. You're dead. You're dead. You're dead. All right. Um. Well, I think we probably should wrap it up. Yeah, no, um, it, you, have, you already mentioned my favorite moment in all the movies because it was the perfect way for Nolan and Bale to wrap up their term as the director and the actor of Batman when Bruce Wayne is with Anne Hathaway and the butler comes to his coffee shop in what is perceived to be Italy off the coast looks gorgeous for the one holiday he takes every year and all he wanted was to see that Christian Bale had disappeared but he was still alive living a real life and I think why this is so impactful to me is because at the end of the day, even though Christian Bale, Batman, uh, Bruce Wayne remembers his mom and his dad, they both died when he was very young. And Alfred was the closest thing he really had to a father. Likewise, Bruce Wayne was the closest thing Alfred ever had to a son. So, and I think it was acted and played perfectly. Um, it's my fondest memory in all of the Batman movies. Uh, most memorable moment for me, uh, it'll probably be the scene in the art museum with Jack Nicholson and where they're destroying the art stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, any, any, any last words as we actually say goodbye to the people? I know. Thank you. Let us know what you think of our Batman review. Is it Superman? Is it Batman? Is there another one out there? Punisher is pretty badass too. Um, so who's the best uh, hero? Who was the best villain? Let us know what you guys think. Uh, share. If you're looking for a great uh, scotch that's been double distilled, um, this one first in oak casks and then also later in uh, such delicious port wood casks. Um, definitely a treat. Definitely is. All right. Um, so real quickly, next week's uh, Smarty Challenge. Actually, we're just going to stay on the Batman theme, and we're just going to do a movie review of the new Batman. Do some compare and contrast to some of the other movies, and uh, just kind of give our breakdown of how the movie how the movie is. Um, and then our – what's the uh, – Scotch we're doing next week? Ah, should we do the Craig Isle? I don't know, whatever one you want to do. Craig Isle 12 year. An Isla okay. single malt scotch. And 42.2% uh, alcohol by volume. All right. And uh, with that, thank you everyone for watching, uh, who watches us on YouTube and Rumble. Drink responsibly. Uh, drink, yeah, definitely drink responsibly. Um, and for those of you who listen to us on Podbean and Spotify, thank you for listening to us. Um, if you could, please uh, let us uh, in the comments down below, as Jesse had mentioned, please leave some comments about who uh, your favorite parts about Batman, who your favorite villain was, who your favorite Batman was, and, and why. And we love to discuss that with you in the comments down below. Um, if you do want to become a patron, if you do look in the comments down below, the very, very first one <laughs> is a link to our Podbean uh, patron link. Uh, you can become a member for as little as $1 a month. Uh, anything that we do get uh, in our uh, from our patrons, that does go back into our show. 
And um, I guess with that, uh, thank you once again, everyone, for watching us. And please like, share, and subscribe our our, our podcast here. We'd greatly appreciate that. And uh, hopefully you all have a great night. And cheers. Cheers. Life is great. Life is great. And uh, same scotch time, same scotch hour. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed this evening's episode of Scotch Hour. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe. Also, if you have not done so already, please become a Patreon member with memberships starting as low as $1 a month. Thank you, and hopefully you have a wonderful evening.